Hey guys, my name is Kenny and I'm an intern here at SideFX and uh, this is a shot from start to finish. A short presentation more geared towards beginners or students who are just trying to get out there and create a shot for their demo reel. We'll start out by taking a look at setting yourselves goals, figuring out what you want to get out of a shot. We're then going to look at camera work and layout, which I think is one of the most important parts to really help you avoid some of the pitfalls that happened with the full CG shot. Finally, we're going to look at executing our shot in Houdini how to make your life easier in some cases, and also rendering using AOVs and finally putting that all together in a compositing program of your choice. So first, let's take a look at the two shots we'll be using as a discussion point throughout the presentation. The idea of both was let's create a shot as if it's part of a slice of a larger project or film. And then just to get this right out of the way, the first desert shot we have here, it was using internal builds for testing. So unfortunately we can't share that one. However, the nighttime ocean scene, we should be able to share the hip file, whether through the content library or elsewhere. I'd like to quickly interject here. If you haven't checked out the content library, make sure to do so. It's got some awesome material on there. If you're like me and prefer to just walk through hip files instead of watching a tutorial, it's absolutely perfect, but let's get back to it. All right, setting goals. This is the first part of presentation where I really want to focus on the concept of setting a goal for yourself to get your shot done. I believe that ideas are fun and this is really where you get to be creative, but a goal is really what gets you to execute that idea. And in this case, for the first shot, let's take a look at the desert shot here. The goal was for me originally to create a some kind of landing. I think originally it was a helicopter landing in kind of a desert environment. And of course, this is the beauty of a personal project, something like this, and something you won't get out of a tutorial per se, is you now find yourself setting new goals. For me, the later goal was, all right, we gotta create an environment and that's gonna be height fields. And then we're gonna change it to a spaceship. So all of a sudden I have to now do a thruster instead of just putting motion blur on a hel rotating helicopter blade. And those are, I would say, almost secondary goals, tertiary goals. And over time, you're going to build up a project. But I think it's a good idea to just start, like, just something you want to do. It could pertain to what your discipline is, what you're aiming to want to do. You know, maybe your goal is I want to create, you know, a beautiful procedural model. And I would say you would present that slightly differently, maybe. And in this case, it was an FX shot, but I wanted to really push it and not just have it on gray. I see there's nothing wrong with putting a shot on gray, especially if you want to just really show off your effects work. But personally, I wanted a full shot. So that was kind of the, that was my goal. That was what I set for myself. I'd like to just quickly point out, I know this kind of sounds like a 10 steps to success program right now. And while in some ways it is kind of formatted like that, I just want to point out everyone's a little bit different. Everyone's going to work a bit differently. This is what works for me. And this is how I can get stuff done. But nonetheless, I just want you to keep that in mind as we continue through the rest of the presentation. All right, moving on to camera layout and previs. Now we'll talk about previs very shortly at the end, but starting with camera and layout, I just want to point out this is kind of the maybe the few times you get to work on shots where you get to set this kind of stuff. Normally this is given to you by another department if you're in FX lighting or environment, etc. But really the camera kind of dictates in a CG shot how much work you're going to be doing. And it can exponentially increase the amount of work you're doing. For example, if I was in that desert scene and we put the camera further back and looking down at the ship kind of towards the horizon line, all of a sudden we're gonna to have to create a massive desert with lots of variation, lots of breakup, probably sand dunes, etc. And we really didn't want to do that. So we set up the layout and camera in such a way where we only needed two environment meshes really the one in the foreground and the one in the background, and we didn't really have to worry about too much because the HDRI would take over for the whole background setting. And in this shot here, where we are looking down at the medieval town, this is a previous shot. We never finished this project. We just kind of, it was an idea, a previous idea that we had. And here, because we're aiming the camera almost straight down, and this is a very good technique to have, it really saves you a lot of work because you can isolate what you want to work on, you can focus on what you want to work on, and I highly recommend this. For the final shot, we're going to quickly look at the ocean scene where, yes, it is kind of a grand sweeping angle and you would be like, oh, but you're going to have to render so much ocean. But we quickly were like, well, this is going to be a nighttime scene. We're going to have rain. It's going to be really hard to see. So we're going to get away with it. And as you can see here, you can really see the spectrum rendering was quite boring. We didn't really, we didn't really uh, break up anything because we knew we didn't have to. The fog would save us. So that's kind of a way to look at layout and camera. I'd just like to quickly cover previs for a second. Previs or previsualization, it's a whole industry in its own way. 
And uh, while for your own shots, you don't really need to do it, and I don't find myself always doing it, I have found that recently when I want to present my work first to kind of explain, like, this is what I want to do. Maybe it's something you can do with your professor if you're at school. Be like, hey, this is the project I want to do. I think it really helps to show a previs. It's also a great way to lock down your final frame range because I found before I would, you know, add a few frames, subtract a few frames, but a previs really sets in, like, these are my frames. This is what I work with. And uh, that's personally my thoughts on it. But it's very optional and you don't really need it per se. All right, on to the next step. So at this point, you know what you're doing, but you might not know how to get there. And this is the R&D and tutorial step. So at this point, you would be maybe watching tutorials. You might be doing your own R&Ds. And also, this could be something you've done months ago, and now you're just applying to your own personal project. Now, there's a really nice talk from Matt Estella from SIGGRAPH 2019 Los Angeles, I believe, the Houdini Hive. Uh, learning Houdini, you're doing it wrong, and how to do it right. And I highly recommend you check it out. It's a good presentation where he talks about the pitfalls of avoiding copy-pasting a tutorial and letting you know that all the CG guys, they know when it happens. And uh, you really want to apply what you learned. And this is where it's a really good idea to create your own personal shot rather than looking at a tutorial and trying to do something similar. I would recommend almost taking a tutorial, the basic idea of it, and applying it to a very different shot with very different parameters. And I think you'll find that you'll learn a lot yourself and you'll also create an awesome shot for your reel. All right, moving on to assets. So you've had your idea, you've done some tutorials, some R&D to get there. And uh, now you're in your scene. Let's play around, let's grab some models. Now, unless you're going for modeling slash environments reel, you really don't need to make your own models. I would say go to places like TurboSquid, CG Trader, Sketchfab, or the Haven sites. And there's many more out there as well. Grab some models that fit your idea, fit your scene. Try to keep a good theme among them. If you do need to create something, like for example, we needed to create the environments here, you know, stick with height fields. They're really easy to use. They give you great results. They give you some awesome masks to play with. And uh, yeah, just keep it simple. Don't really worry too much about it, especially when you're working as an FX lighting, etc. Unless, once again, you're a modeler or you're an environment, you really don't need to show off these skills. All right, moving on to execution. So you've set your goals, you've done your R&D, you have a really good camera angle that's helping you out, really helping you isolate what you're going to be working on, and now you have some assets in your scene. You've probably at this point animated them, you've set up everything you need to go, and now you're going to be working. In this case, we're going to just focus on effects, but you know, depending on what you're doing, there's all kinds of things you should be looking out for. But one thing I just want to say is you want to keep it simple. I don't mean that in you want to make your effects look simple, I just mean your setup in I know I made this mistake a lot when I was in school as I would try to, you know, Houdini is a procedurality beast, right? So you like, oh, I want to make a setup that works in so many different shots. But in reality, you're not on a big project with you're trying to make a build that runs on 600 shots. You're just trying to get this one project done for your reel. So really, I would say be dirty, you know, put a blast down, delete by prim num, you know, keep things simple. Just try to work exactly what you need, keyframe a lot of things, you know, you want that control and you want it to look good. You don't really need to make this for anyone else but yourself. And that was just a little quick PSA because I know it's something that I struggled with because part of me was like, well, I want to be, you know, like an FX TD and create kind of a build setup. But at the same time, you probably don't need to. And most likely you're not going to go back to it, especially if this is your early projects. So just keep that in mind. All right, so you already know how to keep it simple now. We're going to continue the execution, which at this point we're going to rapid fire through some little tips and tricks and some nodes that maybe was used along the way. And this being the first one, it was actually the first time I used it. This is the SOP Pyro Solver. It's kind of a nice node because what it does is it takes your usual kind of dot net setup for a sparse Pyro Sim and just kind of condenses that all into one nice little OTL. You can of course edit it and still go inside, but nonetheless, you've got all you need really. You've got your sourcing. The nice part, it also takes care of exporting for you, even converting it to VDB, as well as you've got the nice uh, pyro bake options in here as well. So essentially it's the same as setting up all of this, but in one node. The best part about it too is like the usual node where you will start adding the micro solvers to really nail and you know, figure out a good look. You can do the same here by just merging them into this top level accessible kind of editing area. But nonetheless, huge shout out to this node. I think it makes life a little bit easier, a little bit quicker. And for something simple like the dust interaction I had in that shot where it doesn't really need anything custom, it's been done a million times, I think it's a perfect little node to use. 
All right, moving on to rest position. So uh, here we look at the thruster setup. You'll be able to access this with the uh, hip file once it's released. But essentially the idea is you want to work some sims, especially when it comes to simple things like these thrusters at the center of the world and then just apply them directly to where the model is. So what we have here is we actually have the ship just sitting in a rest position. Usually this is an attribute. You just save it on there and you keep it and then you can just move the position. There's a lot of ways to do it. You can use the rest node. In this case, just you just position it to rest, which I like to do. But essentially what this let us do is, as you can see, we can take a look at this, which is the thrusters. This is what they look like. We simply just sim them right here. We didn't have to worry about the sim too much, about it growing too large. It's a very quick sim. And then we use some of the data from the ship though, such as the speed in our sim. So it looks like it matches. And then all we use is the point deform, which is a magical node in Houdini. And what it does is you take the rest position of a geometry, the deforming geometry, and what you want to deform to it, and it essentially just attaches what you need. And I found that this node can really be pushed, and you can do some really wacky stuff, and it, it just it just works right through it. So I highly recommend checking it out. It's a good thing to do for thrusters, things like that. If you have you know bullet hits, you can just simulate them in the center of the world and then just place them everywhere you need, maybe different caches. So just keep that in mind. Moving on to the next little tip, maybe the last one out here, but this is the uh, camera fresh trim. And if you don't know what a fresh trim is, essentially the idea of a fresh trim is it is the view from the camera, either through mesh or volume of some kind, but essentially you're just mapping out where the camera is looking and what it's looking at. This is one with a little bit of extra padding, just a simple OTL from yeah, OpenVDB directly just taken from there with some little controls I added, but it'll be available in the file. Nonetheless, uh, this is super useful, especially for something like this rain, which is a particle sim and it also has some mesh included. You can really save a lot of disk space and a lot of post-processing space by just using what you need in front of the camera. So as you can see here, I hope it's coming through well, is we're keeping all the rain just in front of the camera with just about a meter of padding above and below. And this really just helps you out a lot. I can't even show the full one because once again, I'm doing this in the sim, right after the sim, right before I cache it. So I just save disk space and that's the idea. All right, moving on to rendering and the first part, which is AOVs. Now AOVs are arbitrary output variables, but um, I'd recommend you just look into them because that's a whole presentation and more in its own. But essentially it's data that you can have on your renders and we'll show this later where you can then use that in many different ways. And in our case, we had the rain and we didn't want to really light the rain in the with lights. We simply wanted to have one light that lights all the rain and then we wanted to have some attributes that would drive later color corrects and grades and nuke. So what we did is we created this kind of very simple geometry just in front where we can attribute transfer and attribute. In this case, it was called light ship. And we also had light platform. So as you can see, we're going from zero to one and we have some th points that are closest to the lights. Let's see if we have a better frame here. So you can see the points close to the light are getting this nice little attribute and there's a nice little fall off. So what we do is you go onto your material that you've created. You might have to unlock your material and then essentially just put some binds and you put a bind and a bind export. I think you can just get away with the bind export. I'm not actually sure, but this is the way I do it. You simply bind that attribute and now it's on your material. And then finally, when you're in lops, in this case lops, you could do this all directly on the Karma node by adding an extra render var under uh, image output AOVs. And you can see these are all the kind of general AOVs you might be using, but here you can create a custom one. You can set a uh, blueprint for one but in this case, we actually just create one using the render var node. I think I like it. It's kind of nice, keeps everything very Houdini procedural. And in this case, we have light ship, which is a float raw, because it's just coming directly from the material. And we're plugging into the second output of the karma render properties. So we're getting the uh, AOVs or the render vars in this case from there. And what that lets us do now is if you look in comp, this is the ship, or we have the ship right here, essentially, but you can see the lights, and this is the original. This is just the beauty. Everything's the same. We will darken everything, so we want to darken everything. But now we have this right here, which is the light ship, and you can see we're putting in the alpha channel, so we're just shuffling it out to the alpha channel. We can put this in red, green, blue, but alpha is easiest at this point. You can see we have this, uh, we have that AOV, and now we can play with it. We use it as a color correct, so we kind of give a nice little, like there's a fake light in front of the ship. And that's one way you can use AOVs. There's lots of different things for AOVs, especially when it comes to the um, way we render the ocean. And that's with the uh, 
we've got a special attribute which we called I think it was a blend or flatten I'm not sure let's see flatten so if we head up here we can see that if we take a look at our ocean oh later shot we have a attribute called flatten around the edges which we use just to kind of blur out the edge and that's a uh, way you can use AOVs and I think they're super useful some really fun stuff you can do with them also such little things as LPE tags which once again I think is worth the Google search because they're a presentation on their own but it's a lot of fun so yeah keep them in mind super useful all right guys we're almost there as you can see we're moving on to comp and uh, we're not in Houdini anymore in this case I feel most comfortable working in Nuke there's of course Fusion, Cops and uh, After Effects other ways to comp but I think this is very important because you know, in a real setting, you'd be giving your FX as an FX artist, let's say, you'd be giving your shots, you'd be giving your assets to lighting or your final packages, outputs, etc., and they'll be making it pretty. And then you, they're going to give it to comp, and they're going to put everything together and make it even look prettier. And that's the final result. Now, in your own project, you're going to be doing all three, so you've lit it, you've got your renders, but now you're going to mess around with it. And even here, even though this this is already starting to get comped, you can see there's already color corrects involved. We've got We've got a lot of little things trying to just merge everything together, blending it all together as best as we can. And then this is kind of where the artistry comes in, a little bit of fun. Start adding the fog, start adding the glows. The particles and the uh, thrusters on their own are quite a, I think, comp heavy effect. They're really kind of boring on their own directly from render. I'd say you've got some interesting things there, but they don't really look that great until you start adding the glows and the color corrects to really get a nice kind of look there. So obviously very important. This is kind of the final little piece in comp. You get add the heat distortions and whatnot, which is I think just a very, very simple particle sim that just kind of looks like a big puke there. But nonetheless, I distort and now you can get some nice distortion. You can probably see it better once it's cached. Color grenade, color grade, adding a little bit of fake noise, vignette, etc. Finally crapping everything, whatnot, and you get a nice final result. So this is kind of a good way to work. I would say be prepared to comp your stuff because it's going to look better and you can finalize it, polish it off, and really get a nice look at the end. We made it. Congratulations. And thank you for uh, coming along on this little journey with me. I hope you took something away from this presentation. I hope maybe you're inspired to do a little shot now for yourself, for your reel. If you have any questions, I know we'd probably be having some kind of a Q&A maybe here at the end of LA Hug. Otherwise, you know, leave them in the comments on whatever platform you're watching this, if it's in the future. And yeah, um, thank you for coming along. I just want to quickly point out that the Houdini community is so graceful and so nice that you'll easily find, you know, help anywhere. OD forums, we've got the uh, side effects forums, obviously. You know, the Houdini artists Facebook group. You've got the Go Procedural Discord. Got a lot of places to ask questions and a lot of people who are willing to help out, share their thoughts and ideas. And like anything, everyone can work differently. And while this presentation did once again sound like a 10 steps to success program, it's not. Everyone will work differently. Everyone will figure out on their own. But I hope this gave you some kind of blueprint for your own projects. And if anything, at least inspired you to just work on your own fun little project yourself. Thank you for coming along. And uh, yeah, have a good night, guys.